and you're watching Book TV on C-SPAN 2, and we are in London conducting interviews with various authors, and joining us now is Sir Max Hastings, author of several books, mostly on World War II, a new one coming out on World War I. But uh, Mr. Hastings, if we could start with World War II, is there still new scholarship coming out on this time period? It's not so much new scholarship, it's new interpretation that I would never have guessed when I started writing about this period back in 1979, which feels a long time ago now, that I'd still be doing it and there'd still be an audience for it all these years later. And I think there are three reasons. One is that uh, almost everybody still sees World War II as that very unusual thing, a good war, a war in which uh, good was pitted against indisputable evil. Um, and broadly, that's still true, with some exception. Secondly, um, it was the greatest event in human history, that this is something 27,000 people a day died in World War II, 60 million people at least died in the whole conflict. This was the greatest and most terrible event, not only of the 20th century, but of all time. So it's hardly surprising people are still interested. And third, there always still seem new things to be said about it, that you can still surprise people. When I was writing my last book, Inferno, and um, a British general said to me one day, he said, oh, I hear you're writing another book on World War II, Max. What could there be to tell us that we don't know already? And I said, well, let's try a few numbers. Um, what percentage of German soldiers uh, killed in World War II would you guess were killed by the Russians? And he said, well, maybe 60%. I said the true figure was over 90%. Over 90% of all the Germans who died in World War II killed on the Eastern Front. So that made our contribution seem rather less significant. And I tried him on another number, and um, I said, what percentage of Allied casualties would you guess were British or American? And he said, well, maybe 20% each. And I said, well, the true figure was 2% American, 2% British, um, I think 63% Russian, 23% um, Chinese. Um, 7% Yugoslav. These are all numbers. I'm only giving these as tiny examples of how in the 21st century, one of the things I think is, is marvelous about the 21st century audience in the United States and all over the world, we all feel much less nationalistic. We're willing to try and look at things in a much more global sort of way. And I mean, I grew up when I was a young man, my father, who'd adored World War II. He was a war correspondent for a famous British magazine of that day called Picture Post. And he brought me up to look on World War II as sort of great adventure. And a lot of his generation who had enjoyed the war, they'd been fighter pilots or tank commanders or whatever, yeah, you know, they... And my father brought me up in a rather sort of Boy Scouty way to believe I should be sort of sorry I missed out on this great adventure. But... Almost everything that's happened to me as a writer in the intervening uh, 40, 50 years since I was a child uh, looking up at my father has been a process of getting educated, of, of getting real about. Um, and to give you one example, I remember very well when I was writing a book about the bomber offensive and I was sitting in a little bungalow uh, in Lincolnshire in the east of England talking to a guy who'd been a bomber command navigator. And his pilot had won a posthumous Victoria Cross, staying holding the plane um, after it had been badly damaged in the air so the rest of them could jump. And the pilot went down with the ship. And all these years later, there I am in this little bungalow in Lincolnshire, and the navigator says to me, he says, I always remember the last night in the pub before we went on that last trip. And he said, Jimmy, the pilot, we were all teasing him because he was 19 years old and he admitted that he'd never kissed a girl in his life. And what he said went straight through me, and I thought maybe wars in general, and the Second World War in particular, are not quite such a romp as my father brought me up to believe. If you're dead at 19, what good does it do you to have a Medal of Honor or, um, or a Victoria Cross if you're dead at 19, never having kissed a girl in your life? And I suppose I would say everything that's happened to me writing about that period since has been about growing up. And I think what's wonderful is the audience in the United States, um, in Britain, all over, they've all grown up too. And I get marvelous emails and letters, many of them from Americans, who say, when we were kids, 
we never quite realized it was like like this and uh, everybody is so much more responsive and so much they understand more about how terrible the war was for women they understand that more civilians far more civilians died than soldiers we're all growing up mr hastings do we know enough about russia's role in world war ii in the west we're getting that way um 30 40 years ago uh Everybody in the United States thought the United States had won the war single-handed, and everybody in Britain thought the British had done it single-handed with maybe a, um, a little bit of um, um, industrial help from the United States. But nowadays, um, we are getting uh, uh, more grown up about understanding that the Russians did most of the heavy lifting. But they do not deserve most of the credit, because one of the awful truths is Roosevelt and Churchill constructed this great legend of the Grand Alliance, Stalin, Roosevelt, Churchill. And yet the truth was that Stalin's tyranny was every bit as evil as Hitler's tyranny. The only thing that makes Stalin that much less wicked than Hitler was he had no single enormity to match the Holocaust, the massacre of the Jews. But in every other respect, um, Stalin's Russia was, was an equally dreadful place. In 1941, when Russia came into the war, at that time, Stalin had killed far more people than Hitler. Stalin had uh, massacred millions upon millions of his own people in the purges, in the famines, in uh, all the uh, dreadful things that had gone under his, his rule in the 13 years before the war came. But on the other hand, we had cause to be very grateful for the Russians. That an awful lot of um, young Americans and young British men survived the Second World War who wouldn't have done if a lot of um, Russian soldiers hadn't died. I mean, it's incredible. The Russians lost 27 million people in the war and 11 million soldiers. That one in four uh, Russian soldiers uh, died in the war, one in four of those who served. Um, whereas I forget the exact figure, I think it was one in 20 British servicemen and one in 30 odd American servicemen died. So the Russians did a lot of the heavy lifting um, but I don't think we have any reason to be uh, terribly grateful to Stalin, that uh, Stalin was an unbelievably wicked man. And one thing that's very scary today, if you went to Berlin and you saw a taxi driver had a picture of Hitler on his windscreen, you'd think it was something terrible. It's unthinkable that that would happen. But in Moscow, they've still got a lot of pictures of, of Stalin on the taxi driver's windscreens. Putin, Vladimir Putin, goes around saying that Stalin was a wonderful man. He still thinks that. Russian, many Russians are taught in school that Stalin may have got a few things wrong, but he was basically a good man. We should never listen to that. Stalin was the representative of unspeakable evil. 27 million Russians, 11 million Russian soldiers. Yeah. How many English, English, English soldiers, Americans? Americans? It was about... 400,000, both um, the United States and Britain both lost about 400,000 odd in the war by comparison. Um, in the British case, um, that included about 50, 60,000 civilians who were killed by bombing. Um, but that doesn't mean um, that generation, if they were around now, they'd say, don't you for a minute be saying uh, that we didn't do our bit. And we don't think for a moment that I defer to anybody in my respect for um, what that generation in the United States and in Britain did. Um, it's just that in the 21st century, we can take a slightly more global view. I mean, you take China. I mean, a lot of people don't even know China was in the war. 15 million Chinese died in the war. It's, it's amazing. And um, the Chinese got clobbered by the Japanese and by um, their own warlords and, and by Mao Zedong. Um, hardly anybody today um, knows anything about what happened in China. So we know, we tend to know a lot about the things we want to know about. We all know about D-Day, uh, because that was our sort of finest star. We all know about the Battle of Britain. We know um, a lot about the United States Navy and the Pacific, you know, where I personally think the United States Navy was the greatest um, allied fighting force of the Second World War, phenomenal. And what uh, the United States Navy did up against the Japanese was quite something. So we know a lot about all that stuff. But there are a lot of other things we just don't know so much about. Um, and I especially, um, I've come to realize that although, of course, you have to tell the story of the battles in wars, because 
who wins the battles decides who wins the wars. There's a huge other dimension which 30